Hello and welcome to our last lesson of chapter 5, which is section 5.5, Equations and Graphs of Trigonometric Functions. We're going to be looking at how we can possibly use graphs to help find solutions to equations, and we'll look at the algebraic method as well so you can see how you get the same answers. And so there are two ways we can do this. We can use graphs to help us find the solutions by graphing an equation and finding any zeros, and a reminder that zeros are the same as x-intercepts. So if the equation is equal to zero, we can graph and find any x-intercepts. If it's not already equal to zero, we can rearrange it to make it equal to zero. Our other option is if we have a more complicated equation with stuff on both sides of the equal sign that's hard to make equal to zero, we can also graph both sides of the equation and find where they intersect. So hopefully you have done some solving equations by graphing before in previous courses. This will be the first time we are solving by graphing that involves trigonometric functions. So when we've looked at trigonometric functions to model different phenomena, we've looked at things like a tidal wave and how a wave comes in and out of the shore and the depth of the water. We've looked at things like a Ferris wheel and how it turns and the height of a person on the Ferris wheel over time. There's an example below with a YouTube video of a pendulum swinging back and forth, and you can actually see that it looks like a sinusoidal wave. And so we can look at different ways we can solve both just a generic equation using graphing or algebra versus like a word problem. Okay, so we're going to try and solve this equation here, which we know how to do algebraically. We've done this before in the chapter previous to this, and so we will review that. But first, let's try it graphically. So because this equals zero, we're looking for x-intercepts. And we are not used to graphing something that looks like this. We have seen cosine graphs and sine graphs with changes in amplitude, period, displacement, and phase shift. But we haven't seen something with a cosine squared. Now, before we start actually trying to figure this one out, we can rewrite this. As 2 times cosine x all squared minus 1 equals 0. So what this means is our input is our x, which is an angle, and our output should be some number because the cosine x would result in a fraction or a ratio, and then we would be squaring that ratio, multiplying by 2, and subtracting 1. So we can make ourselves a little table of values off to the side to help us do this. And before we start, we might want to more clearly label the graph that's been given here as the axis labels are a little blurry. We have pi over 2 here, then pi, then 3 pi over 2, then 2 pi. And I'm not going to label the y-axis yet because I'm going to want to wait and see when I do my table of values, what sort of numbers am I getting? And that will help me label my y-axis. I also can think about, well, what, what can cosine x be? We know that cosine x is adjacent over a hypotenuse, and we know that the biggest value for cosine x is 1. So that means I would have 2 times 1 squared minus 1, which gives me 1. And my minimum of cosine x we know is negative 1. This would give me 2 times negative 1 squared minus 1, which would also give me 1. 
So I know that I have something with a one here, okay? I don't quite know what my minimum could be, but I know that whatever fraction I put in here and I square it, it would always be positive times by two and subtracting one. Okay. So let's try and make ourselves a little table of values. Okay. So my input would be x, my output is two times cosine x squared minus one. Now if my input is zero, my first value along my x-axis, I would have two times cosine of zero squared minus one. Cosine of zero is one which would give me two times one squared minus one, which is one. So I'm gonna say one is up here, the second dashed line, which therefore would mean down below, I'm gonna have a negative one. I'm gonna try the next X point, which is pi over two. So this would be two times cosine of pi over two, all squared minus one. Cosine of pi over two is zero. So this gives me two times zero squared minus one which is negative one. So I'm gonna have a point down here. And I can continue along this path. If I plug in pi, I end up with two times cosine of pi, which is negative one squared minus one, which is back at one. If I do three pi over two, cosine of three pi over two is zero. So I end up with the same answer I had for my pi over two down here. If I plug two pi in, I'm gonna get back to my one that I had here, which would be up here. Now we know that cosine looks something like this, okay? but what happens when we do cosine squared? Does this change? Well, clearly it changes a little bit because normally when we graph cosine, we have one, negative one, and then we have zero, pi is in the middle and two pi is at the end. Well, this clearly isn't the exact same as what we're drawing because we have a maximum here at pi and normally we would have a minimum for our regular cosine graph. So I might want to figure out a couple more points. Maybe I want to do midway between each of these points. So pi over four and three pi over four, let's say. So let's add to our table of values here. I'm going to do pi over four. So I'd have two times cosine of pi over four squared minus one. And just a reminder, since this is a video, if I'm going a bit too fast, feel free to pause or slow the video down or scroll back. Uh, cosine of pi over four is one over root two squared minus one, which gives me two times one half minus one, which would give me zero. Now I know cosine is symmetric, so that means I should also have a zero at the three pi over four. And I can draw in what this would look like. And then you can tell that this looks like it's gonna repeat itself. So I should probably have a zero here and here. And I would have a second cycle of my graph right here. And if we have pi over four and three pi over four, next should be five pi over four and then seven pi over four. Now we haven't actually answered the question because the question asked us to determine the solutions for the trigonometric function. So I'm looking for what does X equal? And I know that I'm looking for my X intercepts. So my X intercepts are at pi over four, three pi over four, five pi over four, seven pi over four. And I know I don't need to keep going because the question told me I was between zero and two pi. So my answers are X equals pi over four, three pi over four, five pi over four, and seven pi over four. Now we can solve this algebraically as well. So if I've got two cosine squared X minus one equals zero, if you're not happy with how this is written, you could rewrite it as something like two A squared minus one equals zero, where A is equal to cosine X. Then if I solve for A, I get two A squared equals one, or A squared equals one over two, or A equals plus or minus root one over two, 
which would be the same as plus or minus 1 over root 2. And we didn't have an a in the question. We had a cosine x. So cosine x must equal plus or minus 1 over root 2. And then if we think about our quadrant system, cosine is positive in quadrant 1 and quadrant 4. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. My third side must also be a 1. In quadrant 1, the y value would be positive 1. Quadrant 4, it would be negative 1. And then quadrant 2 and 3 is where we have cosine as negative, and we would have negative 1, root 2, negative 1 along the x-axis, root 2 as my hypotenuse. My third side is, again, a 1. My reference angle would be pi over 4. So I would have four answers. Quadrant 1, x would be pi over 4. Quadrant 2, x would be 3 pi over 4. Quadrant 3, x would be 5 pi over 4. And quadrant 4, x would be 7 pi over 4. So we can solve this algebraically like we would have done in our previous chapter, but we can also solve graphically. You could use something like Desmos to help you graph, but usually on Desmos, the axes labels are not in terms of pi. They would just be decimal answers, so it's actually not quite as neat, but it might help you check your solutions. So the next question is asking us to determine general solutions for this lovely trig equation to the nearest hundred. Okay. So if I find zeros, I need to actually make this equal to zero. Find zeros means find the x-intercepts. You find intersections. This means we're going to graph both sides of the equation separately. Okay. And find where they intersect. Okay. So the first portion here, okay, We've got 16 equals 6 cosine of pi over 6x plus 14. If I move the 16 over, I have 0 equals 6 cosine pi over 6x minus 2. So if I think about what this looks like, this means that I have an amplitude of 6. We've moved down to and we have a period of 2 pi over pi over 6, or 12. So if I think about what this thing looks like, I know my basic cosine graph. Again, my basic cosine graph looks like this, where we have a max of 1, a min of negative 1, and we have a period of 2 pi. So this one has been moved down by 2 but has an amplitude of 6. So that means my, my maximum should be 4. And my minimum should be negative 8. Remember, we think of our amplitudes first. So instead of being a 1, this would grow upwards to 6 and down to negative 6. And then we'd move that whole thing down two. So if it grew up to six and moved down two, that gives me four. If it grew down to negative six and moved down two, that gives me negative eight. And I know my period should be 12. This thing didn't move left or right at all, which means the middle of that would be six. And then we usually are concerned with the crossing points as well. So the three and the nine might be useful. Okay. So my maximum would be four. So I should have that at the beginning and the end of my period. My minimum should be 6. I should have an imaginary midline, right? 
at negative 2, which means that I'm actually at this 3 and 9 value on this midline here. And so my graph's going to look something like this. So if we were doing this by hand, we would need to sort of estimate what does this look like I'm roughly at, 9 point what? And then I'm just before 3, so I'm at 2 point something. Okay. I could also graph this in Desmos, graph this new graph here in Desmos, and take a look at where the x-intercepts and y-intercepts are. So here it is in Desmos here. So we can see we've got an x-intercept right here, which is at about 2.35. And we said it should be just before 3, so we could say 2.4. And we have another one right here, which is at about 9.6. Okay, And then they would repeat. So once I get to this third one, that's the first one plus my period. And then this next one would be the second one plus my period. So if I get rid of these two, the 21 is the 9.6 plus my period, which is 12. Okay. So my solutions here, my intercepts, would be here. Oops. Let's fix that. Here and here. So the first one was, we said, 2.4. And since it said general solutions in the question, remember here it said general solutions, my period is 12, so I would write plus 12n, where n is an integer. And my second one was 9.6. For general solutions, I would need to write plus 12, where n is an integer. So this would be if we found zeros. So we rearrange our equation, set it equal to zero, graph it, find the x-intercepts. The other option is to find the intersections. So what this means is we're going to graph both sides of the equation. So we have one function that's y equals 16. The other function is 6 cosine pi over 6x plus 14. So again, we could graph this using our different features. So if our amplitude is 6 and you've moved up by 14, that would mean our maximum would be up at 20. Right? If you've moved down by 6, actually let's even make this even bigger here. If you've moved amplitude of 6 to be down to negative 6 and you move up by 14, then your minimum would be 8. Halfway between these should be an invisible imaginary line at 14. We still should have a period of 12. Our period didn't change, neither did our amplitude. So when I draw this lovely guy, I get a maximum here and a maximum here. My minimum halfway at 6. Okay. I'm going to cross here at 3 and at 9. This is going to look something like this. And then that would be my, say, my y2. Okay, let's call this y2. My y1 is at 16. It would look something like this. And I can see I cross here and here, again, just before 3 or just after 9. Okay. And again, to do this by hand, we would have to take sort of a flying leap at how far before 3 am I, how far after 9 am I, um, or I could plug this into Desmos, have two separate equations. So if I go back to my Desmos, my equation here would now be um, no longer minus 2, it would now be oops, uh, plus 14, and I would have a second equation that was y equals 16. And we can see that I need to scroll up a little bit and I can see my intersection points are here and here. Okay, so the same values we had before. So I shouldn't be getting a different answer just because I'm doing a different method. Okay, so my x1 again is still 2.4. My period is still 12. So I would have 2.4 plus 12n. And my second one would be 9.6 plus 
plus 12 N. Now you might be sitting there going, okay, so we've used Desmos for both of these to get an accurate answer. How on earth would I solve this without Desmos? And the answer is we can still do this algebraically. Okay. So our equation is 16 equals 6 cosine pi over 6x plus 14. So our job is to find x. So how do we isolate x? Well, we need to get rid of all these numbers on the right-hand side and the cosine. So I can subtract 14 from both sides. I can divide both sides by 6. So I get 2 over 6 or 1 over 3. Okay. You might not want to write this as pi over 6 for the moment. You might choose to say let theta equal pi over 6 and replace this, in which case I'd have 1 over 3 equals cosine theta. And now hopefully we remember that in order to solve this, we need to move the cosine over to the left, which means we need to do inverse cosine. Okay. Now, I don't believe the question told us if we were in radians or degrees. So for this one, we could um, have our calculator in either. Okay. Our previous one, though, because of the pi, we were using radians. So we should probably make sure that we keep this in radians so we can compare our answer. So we need to use our calculator in radians mode. Okay. So when we do that, we should get about 1.23 is equal to our theta, but this was not our question. Our question had a pi over 6x, so I can multiply both sides by 6, and then I can divide by pi. You might do that all in one step. Plug that into our calculator, and we are going to get 2.35 equals x, and that's what we had before. We had 2.4. Now, the problem is we need our second uh, x value, right? If we think about cosine, if cosine is positive, go back to here, right? If cosine is positive, we are in quadrant 1 or quadrant 4, okay? Quadrant 1 here, we have that theta is equal to our reference angle, which is what we just found. Right? And in quadrant 4, this big angle here should be, normally we would do 2 pi minus our reference angle, but in this case our period is not 2 pi, our period is 12. So our second angle is going to be 12 minus our reference angle or 12 minus 2.35, which gives us 9.65. Okay. And then for our final answer, we would need to write in general form, we would have x1 equals 2.35 plus 12n, n is an integer, and x2 is 9.65 plus 12n, where n is an integer. So which method you use will vastly depend on what you have available to you. If you have Desmos available, plug it in and quickly use that. Plot the points, figure out where you're either crossing your x-axis or your two graphs are intersected. If you don't have Desmos available to you, unless the graph is provided, it makes it very difficult to solve that graphically. We're going to try one more question. The electricity coming from power plants into your house is called alternating current. This means that the direction of current flowing in a circuit is constantly switching back and forth. In Canada, the current makes 60 complete cycles each second. The voltage can be modeled as a function of time using this equation here. So we have 170 sine of 120 pi t. So the first question is asking us, what is the period? Well, we know that the period 
is equal to 2 pi over b, or in this case, 2 pi over 120 pi, which would be 1 over 60, which if we think about 60 cycles each second, right, that means you're doing one cycle per second. Right? Oh, sorry, one cycle in 1 60th of a second. So we're being asked to graph the voltage over two cycles and explain what the scales on the axes represent. So first, if we take a look at the equation that we were just given, okay, we need to use some of these pieces of information to label our axes. So we have an amplitude of 170. We don't have any displacement, so this means our maximum is 170. And our minimum is negative 170. So let's start with our y-axis here. Maybe we'll go up by uh, 30s or 35s even we could. So if this was 35 uh, or maybe, I don't even know if, let's just do 30s. We'll go 60, 90, 120, 150, 180. And then we'll go negative 60, negative 120, negative 180. Okay. Now we know we need to graph two periods two cycles, okay? So we have to go up to at least two times one over 60 or one over 30, okay? So let's say um, I know that I need to be able to split this nicely in half. So let's do um, eight boxes to be one over 60. And another eight boxes would be two over 60 or one over 30. Halfway between 1 over 60 would be 1 over 120. Halfway between that would be 1 over 240. And then if you go between the 120 and the 160, we would have 3 over 240 or 1 over 80. So we know that for sine, we start at the origin, we end at the end of the period, which is 1 over 60, we cross in the middle. Our maximum is halfway between each of the two points that we have now. So our maximum is 170 about up here, and our minimum is negative 170 about here. So that would be one cycle. A second cycle. We can rinse and repeat, so we end at the end of the period at 1 over 30. We cross halfway between the start and the finish, and our maximum, our minimums are halfway between those. So on the x-axis, we have our V, which is voltage. Sorry, our y-axis is V, which represents our voltage. 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 Our x-axis would be our t, which would be time in seconds. So this is a little bit like what we looked at in the last lesson. And the last question, suppose you want to switch a heat lamp for an outdoor patio on. If the heat lamp requires 110 volts to start up, determine the time required for the voltage to first reach 110. Okay, so if V is equal to 110 and we want the first time this happens, we have two options. Look at the graph or graph this in Desmos and look for where your V or your Y is 110 and actually plot a point there and figure out a nice neat number for T, an exact number. Okay. So if I'm looking for 110, that looks like it's about here. That would be the first time 110 happens. And so we want to know what is this time, okay? So if we changed all these x-axis uh, numbers into decimals, this would be a bit easier to eyeball. But again, Desmos would be the best 
use for graphically if we wanted an actual accurate answer. We didn't have Desmos at our disposal. We would want to solve this algebraically. So in our equation, we're going to replace the V with a 110. So we will have 110 equals 170 sine of 120 pi t. So reminder that the 120 pi t is all inside the sine. So you might want to rewrite this as 110 equals 170 sine theta, where theta is equal to 120 pi t. So to find theta, I would have to divide both sides by 170. I would get 11 over 17 if I do that is equal to sine theta. Then I need to move the sine over, which means I need to do inverse sine of 11 over 17 equals theta. Now again, because of the pi, we probably want to be in um, radian mode here. So let me just make sure my calculator is in the right mode. Okay, so I'm going to do inverse sine of 11 over 17, and that's going to get me 0 0.704, roughly, is equal to theta. Now the problem is we did not have a theta in the question. We had a 120 pi t, so I have 0 0.704 equals 120 pi t or 0 0.704 divided by 120 pi is equal to t. And I get 0 0.0018667, so I'm going to say 19 seconds is equal to t, is where the first one happens. Okay. And if I think about this logically, I know that sine is positive in quadrant 1 and quadrant 2. So my quadrant 1 answer is the answer I just found. If I was asked for the first two, I would have to try and figure out quadrant 2 as well. And that is it for this section.